Hey, Sam. Sir James, how are you? Good, how's it going? Fantastic, buddy. Your hair looks uh, the same every time I see it. Well, I, 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 the key is I don't comb it. Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Hey guys, this is Johnny, and welcome to episode 56 of the Vest Like a Boss podcast. I am here in Ireland with Sam Marks. Guys, greetings from Ireland. A lot of you know Johnny and I are embarking on a 450K walk from Dublin to Galway with the many pit stops in between. We're doing it to raise money for charity, but we're having a great time, and uh, this is just a lot of fun. So glad to be doing it, Johnny. I'm really happy to be here with you. Exhausted from, from walking over, well, how many miles today? 15 miles? Yeah, 40, 45K in two days, and that doesn't include all the elevation. It's insane, but yeah. this is all for Child's Dream. And I'm really excited that this week we're going to have on one of my favorite bloggers, an inspiration mm -hmm. to me personally, and also to probably millions of people out there in the world. James Altucher. Yeah, few people in the world I'd rather have on the podcast. James has been a massive inspiration. Not just in idea creation and work and professions, but in all aspects of life. His material helps people on the upswing, on the downswing, and everywhere in between. So there's just so many things that we could ask him and, and really happy to have him on the show. So there's a Forbes article actually calling him the most interesting man in the world. And I think he actually can be because in his TED Talk, he talked about how he built two businesses mm – -hmm made $15 million mm -hmm. and somehow blew all of it and went pretty much close to zero. He was almost going to lose his home. He was going to, I mean, he, he wanted to kill himself. It mm -hmm. was, I mean, it's, it's, it was insane. And now he's back making, you know, multimillionaire status again. But what's really cool is he's also a minimalist. And he only has 15 yeah. items. <laughs> uh, I, lo I, lo I love so much about him and his honesty about things, it helps people a lot. Because here's the truth. Everybody that you walk past on your way to work in any given day in a grocery store, everybody's got problems. I don't care who they are. And people sometimes find it hard to relate to people about their problems. It doesn't matter. If you're a billionaire, you have problems. If you're poor, you have problems. But James has been through so many different types of life, of, of life and wealth that he is able to talk about a lot of these things, a lot of things that people wouldn't talk about. He'll go there. And I think that's why his content is so important to so many people. And he is a big inspiration for johnnyfd.com mm -hmm. where I try to be even half as, you know, open and vulnerable as James while trying, trying to be inspiring. Yeah. And James really takes it to another level. He's written bestseller books. Uh, he has, Two podcasts, mm -hmm. the James Altucher Show, as well as Ask James Altucher. Yeah. So make sure you guys check the, those out as well and subscribe to those. But I'm, ex I'm excited to have him on. Yeah, I'm excited. He wrote an article on TechCrunch in 2012 that I really want to get his opinion on. Uh, and it was talking about some of the things that you were talking about earlier and was a huge inspirational and uh, inspiration and eye opener to me around the time that we were going to sell our business. And, uh, ever since then, his content has stuck with me. As you go through life, you absorb more and more content and over the course of time, it ends up whittling down and you, and you kind of stick with a few. And James and his content has definitely been one that stuck with me and I continue to digest as much as I can. Well, I'm super excited. I'm super pumped. I know you guys are as well. So let's bring on James Altucher. Everybody, welcome back. Today we have on a very special guest, an entrepreneur, an investor, a writer, a trader, and amongst other things, one of the kings of content, James Altucher. James, welcome to the show, my man. Sam, thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Invest like a boss. <laughs> That's right. Invest like James Altucher. <laughs> well, the, the uh, first thing I want to do is give you a shout out because you put out some of the most valuable content anywhere out there. And I know it's helped me a lot. It's helped my, my co-host Johnny and undoubtedly uh, many of our listeners. And it, it helps people in so many different ways that I don't think it can ever actually be quantified just by how many subscribers you have. So, you know, I hope that you continue blogging and putting out great material for a very long time. I hope so also. You know, it's interesting because when I started blogging, there wasn't really many people doing kind of this intersection between trading business and 
was, I don't even like using the words personal improvement because it was more about my own personal improvement. But now I feel like that area is inundated with just some good stuff, but like mostly garbage from people just trying to get an audience and not really offering a lot of value. And I hope I keep coming up with stories and things to, to talk about just because I, I think there's just a lot of a lot of mixed messages and garbage and even damaging messages out there. Yeah, I agree totally. And I read, I forget which which article it was recently, but I took a line out of it that I thought was you know short and to the point. It kind of reminded me of of the first article I I read of yours, which we'll talk about on this episode. But the line said, "History is writ- uh, is written by the victors." So we usually only get to read the stories of those who went from rags to riches rather than those who took the journey in the opposite direction. And I think a lot of people that are, are new to your content kind of know you as, you know, the successful entrepreneur, investor and content machine. But it, people that have been following you for a while, including myself, you know, we know a little bit more of the backstory. And I know everybody really, you know, appreciates the candor because it's, your content helps people on a lot of different levels, but for me initially, it was it was more in, in uh, relating to to kind of your backstory, which is the article you wrote for TechCrunch in 2012, titled "Facebook Co- uh, Facebook Shareholders: What to Do After You Make a Zillion Dollars." Um, so, was this the first time that you kind of wrote about this subject pretty openly and like t- shared a little bit of your backstory, or had you been doing it before that? Uh, probably, I started a couple years before that. But, you know, I just want to mention on that quote specifically that you mentioned, Mm -hmm. you know, we always hear about like, oh, if you work hard, if you hustle, if you, um, you know, uh, every day, like, you know, write, you know, picture your goals and write them down, you're going to succeed. There's that is so not true. (laughs) Like, like one per like everybody who writes down their goals and like, Oh, here's where I want to be in 10 years. I'm going to have like $500 million and I'm going to work hard for it every day. Maybe like one tenth of a thousand uh, people, you know, one tenth of one of a thousand people actually get that. And we never, and we hear about them. We like, we hear about Elon Musk, but we don't hear about all the other people who worked hard every day. And then 10 years later, they realize they wake up and they realize, oh, my God, I've been working so hard for 10 years and I totally am miserable and I didn't get anywhere. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's the problem with all this kind of like kind of self-help and business improvement and, and, and what I'll call hustle por- pornography. Like it's just that in general, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, I agree totally. There's, you know, the book, the book, of course, a lot of people know the secret. And then there's, there's Wayne Dyer, who I know you're a big fan of, and I am too. He wrote the book, The Power of Intention, but that's much more based on, yeah, you have to think about these things. You have to have a positive attitude and you have to have a plan, but you actually have to really put in the work and follow it. And if you just have like the positive thoughts and stuff and sit in your room all day, you're never going to get anywhere. Yeah. Like, like, t- let's just take your example, Sam. Skysig. It's not like you just like create this company and then, you know, everybody focuses on, oh, a few years later you sold it. Mm-hmm. You had to like, I don't know, go to China. You had to put together manufacturing agreements. You had to do all this like really unpleasant stuff to, to make things happen. And, and, and there was probably a little luck involved. Like, where would you say, here's, here's an interesting question for you. Mm-hmm. Where would you say was the luck in, in your story? Well, timing had a lot to do with it, but you know, of course you create you, you create timing to a certain degree. And I can confidently say where we won was almost how you you just hit it on the head was going to China where we had an absolute competitive advantage because all the people that were getting into e-cigarettes at the time were basically traders. They had some type of pre-established distribution channel and they were just plugging it in. So maybe they they had distribution to 300 gas stations. They were just sourcing product and putting in there. Whereas we had nothing. So we had to create everything. And by me going over to China and spending, I would spend months on end living at a, at a factory and building relationships up with the manufacturing directors and all the, all the you know, working on the assembly lines with the people. Uh, so we were one big family and we ended up producing a much, much better product that, that kind of changed the industry. So yeah, it was very unpleasant at times to say the least. Right. And then let me ask you a question. Like I always sort of feel like when you compare two products, even if your product is 20% better than all the other products out there, 
the average person on the street doesn't know that, like doesn't know how to recognize 20% better. So you have to be literally 10 times better for someone to notice. So how did you get like, when you came back to the States with a product, how did you get people to notice, oh, we're significantly better than our competitors, you have to buy us? Well, e electronic cigarettes now, for the most part, are, are kind of commoditized. So there's not a lot of distinguishing between the different brands. But when we started, we were actually in uh, 2009, and we were in the UK, so we weren't even in the US. Uh, that was a, that was another big leap for us is there was already a couple established brands in the US. And of course, I'm an American citizen. Uh, so I went to the UK. I had never been to the UK before. I'd never been to Europe before. And we started there. But at that point, it was much more, you know, we were building both the category of electronic cigarettes, but we were also building the brand. So so as the, the category started to emerge, we really just focused on brand. And at that point, brand was really important because it was such a new technology and it was a consumable product that people wanted to think that they were with a really strong brand. Whereas now it's everyone knows about the product. So um, I don't think that our product was 10 times better, but we got such a jump start in marketing and building the brand that people naturally kind of came to us when uh, when they're looking online. So so let me let me dissect it a little bit. So you know you've been involved in a lot of kind of so-called digital nomad uh, efforts, which is this idea that you can be an entrepreneur from anywhere. So you have a passion for travel, and so part so you were able to kind of take this passion, which is really kind of a. Uh, uh, it, it's a personal passion. It's not a financial passion, like being able to travel around, but you were able to take it and, and, and combine it with something you probably weren't interested in. Like who is really that interested in developing an e-cigarette mm -hmm. and you, you travel to China, you travel to UK, the UK, you were willing to do all these things that other people weren't necessarily willing to do. And then combine with that, Rather than doing something 10 times better, you did the next best thing, which is you created your own category in a place where it didn't have the category before, which is a key to creating your own luck. Like everybody wants to compete with, you know, something that already exists, but, you, but really the better strategy, as Peter Thiel has even said, is creating your own category. So you're able to come, you, you started, it sounds to me like you started first with your, your passion for, you wanted to figure out how to do something where you could travel and use that passion to get a little bit of an edge over anybody else. Yeah, that's pretty much correct. I mean, there's a there's a lot of factors in us going to the UK. A lot of it had to do with just me being single and and thirsty for adventure and and business. I was also going through a bad breakup and I was like, yeah, I just got to get out of Florida for a bit. I don't care where I go, but I got to get out of Florida and the UK seemed like a good place to go. And then the China, the whole China side, I mean, we never thought it was it was going to be necessary to go over there, but when I did finally go over there and I realized I can walk in any single one of our competitors factory and see exactly what they're up to. I can see their volumes. I can see their designs. I can see their products. I can see what they're putting in their products. I can see what's selling. I can talk to their, their sales director and figure out every little dirty secret that they have because they all want our business. And so even at, I was only 25 when I started going over there, it was just totally eye opening. And even without having a lot of experience in manufacturing or even business at that time, I knew it was just a really good opportunity. We had to start investing time there. So, 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 so even doing that is kind of in its own way, creating your own category because you were willing to do something your competitors weren't, you were there on the ground seeing what they were doing. And so when I started, for instance, blogging about my failures and successes, so many people were afraid now it's different, but so many people were afraid to to kind of admit, oh, I've failed because mm -hmm. there, there's real there's real danger and harm in doing that. Like at the time when I was doing that, people would basically start avoiding me on the street or 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 people would refuse to in, invest in, let's say, a company I started or a fund I started or whatever, because they're like, why, why should I invest in this failure? But everybody's got these points in their background where they're a little bit ashamed about it. And part of, I think, being not a successful businessman, but a successful human being is confronting the things you, you feel shame about. Shame is like this weird, uh, dangerous emotion. Confronting the things you feel shame about and and it, just admitting it and acknowledging it and, com and, and, and coming to grips with it. You, you can't eliminate your past, but you could come to grips with it. And was that part of, of the purpose behind blogging about this stuff? Was it was it somewhat self-therapy in a way? Or is it more just because you thought you could really help a lot of people out there? 
I would say it was neither. Like I didn't realize it was self therapy until later when I realized, oh, I feel better about these things. I would say I, I just like you, I had a passion, which is I felt really, really good when I wrote a good story. So it had nothing to do with money. It had nothing to do with, you know, of course I wanted people to like what I wrote, but it had nothing to do with creating like an email list or anything like that. But what happened was, is I would write a good story. I would finish that final word and I would feel it like in my heart, in my chest, like, ah, this reminds me of like my favorite writers. And I'm actually contributing to this millennial long effort to create something that I feel has value. Mm -hmm. And then I would publish it. And of course, I wanted people to like it. Like everyone says, oh, you shouldn't care what people think. Of course, you want to care what people think. Otherwise, you should just move to a cave and disappear. Like, of course, when you create a product, you want people to like it and right. use it. Of course, when I write something, I want people to read it and, and enjoy it. I don't want to write for like three people. I want to write for as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. But first, I had to feel like, you know, I've been wanting to write, be a writer ever since I was a little kid. I had to first feel that that passion, like, oh, my God, this is this is good. This is so much fun. I, I love doing this. Because I was a heavy reader, too. So I understood what the difference between, let's say, what I considered bad and what I considered good writing was. And I wanted so desperately to be good. And that's what felt good for me. But then, of course, I realized, yes, this if I like it, pe other people will probably like it. And, and finally, it was definitely self-therapeutic. Like I realized the more I wrote, the more the better I felt. I have a, a quick funny story about this article. So someone had sent this to me in 2013. You wrote this article in 2012. Someone sent it to me in 2013 before we sold our business. And I, you know, I, I ate it up. I loved it. I shared it around. And then about a year ago, I had a friend that was also selling a business. I went to send it to him and I couldn't find it. The only key word that I remember from this article was libido. And I knew that you had written it. So I kept Googling. 10 different variations of James Archer libido, James Archer lost libido, don't lose your libido by James Archer. <laughs> so finally, I found it and um, I put it put it in my reading list. But my Google oh, search, my Google search queries is full of weird stuff now. <laughs> so now you're getting all these. Now you're getting all these ads like boost your <laughs> testosterone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All your libido. <laughs> Retargeted for life. Yeah. So I just want to kind of dive into the article a little bit and share anything you're comfortable with and, and feel free to pass over anything you're not. But no, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with anything. Excellent. Excellent. So, I mean, the, the, the basis of the story was mistakes that you made and advice to kind of the, the, the Facebook shareholders were about to make many, many millions of dollars, if not more. And it looks like that. So you made about 15 million and it looks like you lost it in, a, in the summer during the dot com boom. Is that more or less accurate? Yes. Yeah, it was like uh, I lost like a, about a million bucks a week uh, during the summer. And it wasn't like on paper. It was like cash money that I had pulled out. <laughs> so can you can you break that down a little bit? Like what, what mistakes you made? Um, you know, yeah. how, how did you go that quick? Well, I'll just say as an umbrella to that, that I'm functionally an idiot. <laughs> like okay. I am just not – capable of like dealing with human society very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just doing everything that, that, Oh, I have all this money. I must be like uh, a genius. And I, I, and I did the goal. I did the human goal. I made all this money. So I don't need to improve as a human anymore. I'm, I'm all done with that now. And here I was like 30 years old or 31 years old. And I figured, ah, I don't need to, I, I, I you know, I'm done with improving. Mm -hmm. And so I would just spend money on anything. I would I would uh, buy houses. I would uh, buy artwork. I was going down to Atlantic City a lot. I would like take a helicopter down. Take a, I had a house in Atlantic City, and then also I would. I figured, oh, I, I was such a genius with my own business. I'm gonna just that means I must know a lot about business. I'm gonna just start investing in all these other businesses. So I didn't know any. I actually didn't know anything about business. And at the time, this is like 17 years ago now, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I would just start investing in all of these just stupid, stupid businesses and they needed more money. Ah, I was just, here's, here's more money. And I wouldn't even like write up contracts. I was just dumb. And yeah. before I knew it, um, and then, and then, you know, of course, internet stocks started going down. So here I had pulled all the cash 
out of my internet stocks, making every smart decision in the world. And then I said, oh, the internet stocks are going down, but the internet's not going anywhere. And I started plowing all the money back into internet stocks when they, when they still were going like way down. Mm -hmm. And I just was told every, every decision you could possibly make wrong, I made wrong. Until this is literally like I had millions of dollars. I had enough for the rest of my life and for my kids and for my parents and everything. Like my, my dad had a stroke at one point and And if I had just saved this money, maybe I could have helped him. And I just wasn't able to. But at the end of all this, I had one hundred forty three dollars left in my ATM machine. Like I would go to the ATM, check my balance. And I remember like, oh, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Like, I, I just, I realized then I had won the lottery ticket, like, and I didn't know anything. I was never going to win. Like, you can't win the lottery twice. Like, it's unlikely. Mm -hmm. So just what the heck am I going to do after winning the lottery? Am I going to, I didn't know what to do. I was, I had a, I had a mortgage. I had, I had these huge expenses at this point because I, I was paying for my house still. And it was just a disaster. When you built your business did you essentially go from zero to making a ton of money kind of all at once? Or did you all, were you creating and saving a lot of money along the way up into the exit of your business? No, I built, uh, I built a business starting from scratch. We didn't raise a dime of money, uh, but we, uh, we were a service business. So that means every client we had, we were profitable on, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to a product business where you invest a lot of money up front in building your product and then you hope to sell it. We would basically sell our service, you know, make, get some money and then hire some people to execute on that service. We were specifically, we were, you know, building, um, websites for companies that didn't even have websites then. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I didn't, we were very profitable, but I didn't save any money along the way. We, we kept plowing the money back into the business and we, we built a good business. I mean, I would say our one mistake was we were profitable right. and, you know, at the time all these companies were going public without being profitable. And, and you know, what's funny, I'm a software guy by training. And so I was building all these tools to easily help me make websites. So some of these you know, some of these tool type companies were going public for billions of dollars and their tools weren't even as sophisticated as the tools I was building mm -hmm. to make websites. But I didn't think the tools had any value at all because they weren't, they weren't the reason we were profitable. I didn't really understand business at all at this point that, that, you know, I didn't understand what SaaS software was and, you know, all these things that, that you understand now to, to build a lot of scalable value in a business I just thought, oh, okay, if we're generating profits, we're, that means we're good. And if we didn't generate profits, we were bad. So I, I, didn't, I didn't understand basically beyond business 101. Gotcha. So I know after that happened, you went through some down times. But you know, how did, generally, how did you get back on your feet and rebuild and, and start to build up professionally as well? Not just mentally, but you know, get back on track with, with business and, and building. Well, you know, after after losing that kind of money, I was like super depressed and and even suicidal. Like I thought when I had a lot of money, I, I would did the smart thing. I, I got a, a nice, expensive life insurance policy, you know, for my kids mm -hmm. and my kids were little babies then. So I thought, oh, this is great. I could just kill myself and they'll have this money and they won't even remember me. And so but I was. I really sort of, you know, for, for better or for worse, for really for better, but I decided not to kill myself. There's really no easy way to kill yourself. If you, Sam, if you type into Google right now, I want to die. It used to be I was the first result in Google. Now I think I'm like the third or the fourth result. People complain. So uh, the suicide prevention hotline became like artificially the first result on Google. <laughs> okay. But, but th there's really no easy way to do it because you could risk, uh, you know, just blowing your eyes out and being blind for the rest of your life mm -hmm. or or being mentally damaged or whatever. So, so I don't recommend anybody do anything. But I decided, OK, I needed I need to come back from this depression. That's the one thing I will say where it's not you, you really have to take care of yourself like you have to. You can't you can't start a business. You can't make a comeback if you have no energy and being depressed 
and lying in bed all day and kind of crying and stuff like that is not going to so you're not going to suddenly wake up and say, oh, my gosh, I have this great idea for a business and then have the energy to, to start building these businesses. So I had to physically make sure I was in shape. I was well rested. I was eating well. I had to emotionally you know, make sure I was around good people, people who I loved and who loved me and who supported my efforts. And I had to make sure I was creative every day. So I started writing down, you know, ideas every single day just to build back up my creativity muscle because it's a muscle like any other muscle. And if you don't use it, you're going to, it's going to atrophy mm -hmm. just like all your other, if you don't walk on your legs for three weeks, you're going to need physical therapy to walk on your legs again. And I, I, so I started writing down ideas every day. I started sending those ideas to other people, not ideas about me, but like I would write, Sam, here's 10 ideas for your podcast or Jim, here's 10 ideas for articles you should write about or Victor, here's 10 strategies for your hedge fund that you should trade. And so I would do this over and over to dozens and dozens of people. And eventually two or three people would get back to me and say, um, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll meet with you or we'll you can, you, you should write the articles or why don't you do these hedge fund strategies? And so suddenly I started having things to do, even though I had no expectations when I sent out these ideas and bit by bit, then I would build up, build up using these connections I would build. And at this point you weren't blogging yet, correct? No, I wasn't. I mean, I was writing about financial stuff for, for many years, for about eight years, mm -hmm. but, uh, I didn't start blogging about my personal life until about 2010. Gotcha. So now I assume things are, you know, for at least from the outside, things look great. Uh, I know you're an angel investor in what, about 30 companies now? Yeah. Dude, how do you keep that all organized? Like all the paperwork and the different types of terms? Like, doesn't that just rattle your brain? Yes. So I don't do that. I, I, I am what I call a choicest. So uh, over time, if I, I focus very much on not making not being involved in the choices that don't give me pleasure and and being involved more and more in the choices that I enjoy. So I enjoy writing, I enjoy podcasting, I enjoy coming up with ideas, but I don't enjoy paperwork, I don't enjoy managing. I mean, I also run a company with about, you know, uh, 15 employees or so, mm -hmm. uh, but everything I don't enjoy doing, I outsource or partner with other people who do enjoy doing those things. And that, that means I give up some of the upside, which is fine. As long as, you know, we only live one life. And so you want to enjoy as much of your day as you possibly can. And I'm not saying everyone who's listening to this can do it tomorrow, but you can start doing tomorrow, making more and more choices that are choices you want to make. Choose yourself, right? Exactly. So, so for instance, um, you know, I have a, a business partner who deals with all the paperwork of all the companies we invest in. And I don't even enjoy doing due diligence on companies like that's kind of boring to me. So I won't invest in a company unless there's someone a lot smarter investing alongside of me who's already done all the due diligence. And I've worked with them before so I can trust that they've done the due diligence before. So for instance, I just invested in a company. It's like the, the Alibaba of Africa for, for a lack of a better metaphor, but uh, a very well-known venture capital firm is investing in it. And they just, op they opened up a small slot for me to invest alongside of them. And they said, do you want to do any due diligence on your own? And I said, no, why should I? You've got like 20 PhDs who went over to Africa to do the work. What am I going to do that you haven't done already? And plus you have multi-billion dollar exits. Like what am I going to do? Argue with you about this investment? Mm -hmm. So I just, I just blindly sent in my money. With your angel investing, do you see that as all the investments that you make, do you see that as something that makes financial sense? Like you think you can make the best returns there or do you do it just because you like, you know, surrounding yourselves with smart, young, aspiring you know, entrepreneurs. I don't surround myself with any entrepreneurs. I can't, <laughs> I can't stand talking to them. <laughs> if an entrepreneur has to call me after I've invested, that means something went really wrong. <laughs> and like they, they went all the way down the chain of people they could call. And they're like, oh my gosh, now we got to call James <laughs> after all of this. And we got to so, hear his ideas. 
Right. So, so, uh, but I will say I've made more money from angel investing than from starting companies. So I've had like three or four exits starting companies and the angel investing has, has definitely now surpassed the entrepreneurship phase of my life in terms of making money. Well, that's incredible. We don't, we don't talk to too many people that are in that category. So that's really cool to hear. I mean, it's good that it's good that I've been an entrepreneur. So I know, I mean, I've run companies from tiny, you know, startups, like the, the first one I mentioned to you. So I've, I've helped run billion revenue companies. So I really know the ins and outs of running a company. I've also run um, hedge funds and venture capital funds. So I know, I know the ins and outs of just about every investing strategy out there. But at this point, I really like the, the style of investing that I'm, I'm doing and, and how I'm doing it. So you covered a lot of different sides in finance. Do you invest in anything else outside of you know your typical stock bond portfolios and property like that? Well, I, I haven't really done property, um, although I kind of understand how to do it, uh, having spent a lot of time with, with real estate investors and, and invested in real estate investors. I mean, there's a lot of styles of investing that I think are interesting, but I just don't do them. But I, I like uh, uh, angel investing. I, I do have a company that I'm running, but I have kind of outsourced the management of that. Uh, I've, uh, I have a very good team in place, uh, which is involved in, you know, kind of monetizing my own content. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we're extremely successful. It's doing very well. But in terms of angel investing, I invest in all sectors of the economy. Like I don't like to be just tech. I, I invest in energy, uh, product, you know, consumer products, food. Uh, I'll invest in any type of company. But and also, although I mostly do seed, I'm also an investor in in Slack at a at a billion dollar valuation. So oh, cool. um, I'm I'm all over the place. Good stuff. Well, James, we should get into a couple of listener questions. Not a couple. I've got about five here if you have the sure. time. All right. These are going to be fun. They're kind of all over the board, a little bit on business and uh, a few just with a lot of stuff you talk about with happiness and, and things around those areas. So the first one is on the topic of happiness. How do you relate wealth, financial wealth and happiness? You know, I think... Okay, let's 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 just cut out all the crap in this. Can I say crap on your podcast? Oh, yeah. So let's just cut out as many four letter words as you want. <laughs> let's cut out all the crap. People who are homeless and struggling are usually not that happy. And people who have a billion dollars usually have, I don't want to say they're happier, but usually they have more opportunities to be happy. That's why all these billionaires are, do all this research on anti aging because life is so good for them that they just don't want to die ever. <laughs> So, so let's just let, like I don't want to say money buys happiness because it doesn't. I I usually think what happens is is that you're you you find you find things that you do that are happy. You find ways to monetize those, and you're still happy. And now you've, you're even happier because you've achieved you, you you've achieved you you've been doing so well at what makes you happy that you've managed to monetize it, and that makes you even happier. So happy you can't be happy all the time because we're we're you know. As humans, we're just like kind of a, a, a sack of chemicals in our brain. And some of those chemicals make you happy and some of them make you stressed and so on. And, and you kind of cycle through those. There's, this is just plain science. But I do think that when you find things to do that make you happy, you get even happier when as a side effect, uh, you're able to monetize those activities. And then you're able to do even more. You're able to make more choices in life that you enjoy and you become even happier or you have more opportunities for happiness than you did before. So someone who's who thinks many people think, oh, well, I have to pay off my mortgage first and then I'll be happy. I think many of those people end up being not happy because for so many years they've sacrificed their own health and happiness to uh, another goal, which is. Uh, getting their kids through college or, or paying the mortgage or whatever. And so they've kind of postponed uh, a lot of happiness when they didn't have to. So, so I think, you know, again, it, it sort of starts with happiness, but, but money will definitely help cement it a little bit more. So, so that's, yeah. everybody says they're completely different and they're not. But I do think you need to do things that excite you and, and you're passionate about or else the people who are passionate about those things 
will destroy you because they're going to put in that much more energy and time into what they're doing. Like, like, you know, um, you know, classic example is sports. Like you, you have many people who worked hard as kids on the basketball court, but the ones who really enjoyed passionately, you know, practicing from six in the morning till 10 at night, those are the guys that became Michael Jordan. The ones who were just simply talented and, but they didn't really enjoy practicing. They maybe joined the NBA, maybe not. And they just didn't do as well and, and had shorter careers. One of the places that I personally struggled and I see a lot of people that come into wealth struggle. And I didn't realize what was the issue was. This was after we sold our business and I just found myself kind of grumpy a lot. And I, I finally heard Tony Robbins say something that was so short and made so much sense and, and totally changed the way that I view things. And that was the reason that he finds people with money to be most unhappy is because they now live a life of expectation instead of appreciation, which makes total sense when you have people like, for instance, like me, I came up kind of middle, lower class. Every time someone did a favor for me, I was so appreciative. And then... As you come into money and you start spending, you start expecting things. You start expecting things to be five stars. You expect things to be efficient. You expect, you know, people to to tend to you in, in certain times. And if you if you let that get to you and you don't understand it, it can be a really, really nasty cycle. I think that's true. But I also I think like I know for me, when I whenever I've made a, a, a lot of money, it's usually because for many years I was doing something I felt passionately about. So I was able to sell that passion to customers because I, I had a vision of what how I felt they should use my services or products. And and then I would, again, be excited about creating something that was useful because I, I enjoyed it. And uh, once I made money, I was no longer doing the things I enjoyed. Suddenly I was buying houses or uh, like you said, traveling around to five star hotels or or, you know, doing all these things that people with money do, but had nothing to do with anything that ever excited me for the prior 30 or 40 years of my life. Like, uh, like I love, I really, ever since I was 10 years old, I love to write and, and I love to create things. So, so before I sold my first company, I was working on TV shows, I was writing, I was creating websites, and we were always hired because of our creativity. Suddenly, I stopped being creative and I just started spending money. And I didn't enjoy, I never in my life enjoyed spending money. I, I had never had anything to do with money. I had no money at all when I first moved to New York City. I had zero. And so in, instead, the way I kind of got, I, the way I kind of got the respect of the people around me, which translated into building a network of people around me, was I was creative and I was doing things that excited them. And so I stopped doing that when I made money. And that was really my my downfall. So you, you kind of have to keep doing the things that make you creative. We, we all feel we all have certain needs. Right. So what, why do we want money? It's because we, we have a need for certainty in our lives. We want to know that we could pay next month's rent or next year's rent or or and, and raise our kids and so on. But we also want possibility. And, and money is not there for us to stay in five star hotels. Money is to open up more possibilities for us. Like, oh, now I can spend more time maybe writing that novel I always wanted to write or maybe traveling around like I always wanted to do. We also want significance. We want to know that, um, oh, because I'm creative and because I have energy and because I'm associating with good people, I'm going to do something that can contribute to the world and that can create significance for me. And I, I think, mm -hmm. and, and we also want growth. We want to know that we're still improving as a human being, which I think money deludes us into thinking, oh, we, we don't need to do that anymore. And I think when, when you, I think we have to remember that, that those needs still need to be satisfied because we're still a member of this big tribe called the human species. And from an evolutionary perspective, money doesn't change those needs at all. It doesn't change our genes all of a sudden. Just like the book Sapiens says, yeah, exactly. So we have, we have the exact in Sapiens. He says we have the exact same genes we had well, that we had forty thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. But there was no such thing as as money then. Instead, you had to figure out how you were going to grow, how you were going to stay healthy, how you were going to creatively find food and, and adapt to new environments. 
and how you're going to contribute to the crowd, crowd uh, the, the tribe and be and be significant in the tribe. James, what is the most intimidating thing you've ever done? Is it a TED talk or an interview or or something totally different? Well, all all of those things have been intimidating. I'm intimidated all the time. So like, I don't know, I always put myself in situations that intimidate me. So for instance, uh, a few weeks ago, I interviewed probably the best chess player in world history, Gary Kasparov. Mm -hmm. And I've been a chess player since I was a kid, a tournament chess player. And uh, that was intimidating to me. But also, I'm a huge fan of stand-up comedy. And I've, I've challenged myself to go up every week and, and do stand-up comedy. And that's incredibly intimidating to me. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, see, I got to come see that. <laughs> even thinking of that is intimidating. And so I get up in a crowd of people who don't know me at all. And I have to tell, I have to come up with material that's going to make them laugh basically every 10 seconds. And that's extremely intimidating. And I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm doing all the thing, things all the time that are intimidating to me that I'm scared of. Is your, is your stand-up on, uh, is it on like YouTube or anywhere online? No way, man. No way. <laughs> We're going to find it. I think there, we can dig not, it out I, somewhere. I could, I could, trust me, it's not anywhere. <laughs> Well, we'll come up. Where where do you do it? In New York? Yeah, yeah. So lately I've been doing it at this club, Stand Up New York on 78th Street and mm. uh, every 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 week. Well, round, well, round of applause for you to do that. Day of the week I'm doing it because I don't yeah. want to go. Hey, I'm flexible. I got time. <laughs> All right. Next question. Uh, we've just got a couple more left. Do you still write down 10 ideas a day? Absolutely. That's awesome. I never stop. And are those those are all just any ideas, right? No, doesn't need any type of script or category, just an idea. And a lot of the ideas will be bad ideas, but they're just ideas, right? Yeah. In fact, you want them to be mostly bad. Just realistically, you want them to be bad ideas because it's not as if you're going to have 3,650 like great ideas a year. You're going to have maybe one or two good ideas a year or maybe like a, a lot of little mini good ideas a year. But you're not going to have like earth shattering ideas every time you sit down. And I think people just have to get used to that. It's just like when you go to the gym, it's not like you're going to, you know, lift incredible. You're not, no, you're going to have an incredible gym session every single time. You're just exercising. So this is just writing ideas is not intended for practical use. It's just intended to exercise. Love it. Great stuff. Okay. And then last one in your TED talk, I thought you raised a point that was very interesting and almost sad in a way that when the, the average kid laughs, how many times a day? 300 times a day? Yeah. Uh, and then the average adult laughs, what, three times a day or four times a day? Yeah, around and, the average adult laughs, according to research, around five times a day. So sad. So sad. Uh, I actually woke up this morning and played a prank on my friend just to, to get a, a morning laugh in. But is there anything that you do to practice trying to be around Oh, obviously you do the stand-up comedy, but on a regular basis to to try to bring more laughter into your life. Well, yeah, you know, and and, and par- part of it was because of this statistic. But I I try to listen to stand-up comedy all throughout the day. Like I'll go on YouTube and plug in my favorite comedians and listen to stand-up comedy. I'll watch sitcoms. I don't really like dramas or anything like that. I'll wa- I'll watch sitcoms. So I have nothing against TV. I think TV is kind of in a golden age right now. And so I love watching like really good sitcoms. I, I interview for my podcast. People think of my podcast as like a business podcast, but I mostly interview people who are going to make me laugh. And uh, uh, I think it's so important. You know, laughter has been shown to have like, you know, a healing effect on the brain, uh, reduces inflammation, cures cancer, lets you sleep better. Um, so laughter is so important to me that I, I spend a good chunk of my day figuring out how to, how to laugh more. That's awesome, James. Well, man, this has been a lot of fun. What can, you know, what can we all expect from you in the future in terms of what you're doing, how we can interact with you, what we can see more of, of from you? Well, you can find most of my writings at jamesaltature.com or, or on Amazon, any, any of my last books in the past five years or, um, Look, I want to do uh, what excites me is kind of being more entertaining. Like I'm, um, I'm taking my podcast and seeing if that should be a radio show or a TV show or you know what more things can I can I write about? Like I'm, tr- I'm trying to reinvent what I write about because I've been kind of writing about these topics that we've discussed, you know, now for the past seven years. So you know, there's only so much I can write about myself. So so I'm trying to just reinvent the way I write you know, hence my last book, Reinvent Yourself. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm just trying to figure out more outlets for, for creativity. I just bought that book for my mom, actually. I'm getting it from my mom because she's now 65 and been trying to reinvent herself for the last 40 years. <laughs> and now she's finally kind of retired. And I'm like, you know what? This is the exact type of thing that you need to read. So trust me, you're never too old for it. Look, look, I'm 49 years old, right? And so that means next year I'm going to be 50, like a half a century. That blows my mind. And I just started going up on this stand up stage just uh, four weeks ago. So, you know, not that I'm going to be a professional comedian, but you can do anything you want at any time of your life. I, I took, I just took, I just took shooting lessons with, with a rifle, like uh, about two months ago for the first time in my life. Like you, you could do whatever you want, whenever you want. <laughs> I could see you walking down uh fifth Avenue with a rifle in your hand on the oh, way then, to the shooting I'd get range. Arrested, but, but not <laughs> Texas. I, I did this. I was in Texas a few weeks ago and I did a podcast with Tim Kennedy. Who's, um, mm-hmm. It's a number number ten ranking, or you know, in the top ten for uh, mixed martial arts, and um, he also is a special forces guy. And in the middle of the podcast, I realized he had a, a gun sitting on the table uh, in between us. So Jeez. in Texas, you could just like kind of hang out with your gun, but in New York, you can't. Yeah, right. Exactly. Well, James, hope you keep creating, keep blogging, keep podcasting, all the above. I think it helps people a lot more than you'll ever know. Uh, certainly, Thank just you. based Thank on views or subscribership. So keep it up, if not for you, for everybody else out there. And thanks so much for coming on the podcast. We've really enjoyed it and looking forward to sharing it with everybody. Thanks a lot, Sam. Thanks for having me on the show. It's a great show. You betcha. Bam. That must have been one of our favorite episodes so far in Invest Like a Boss. Yeah, uh, where to begin? As expected, phenomenal guest and a ton of takeaways. So if you guys actually haven't read the TechCrunch article, Facebook shareholders, what do you do after making a zillion dollars? We'll have a link to that in the show notes on investlikeaboss.com, episode 56. But to go, just kind of go over some of the highlights from it. Mm-hmm. The one-year rule, don't change your lifestyle for at least a year. No friends rule, don't lend money to old friends. Don't be so quick to make new friends. Don't invest in anything. (laughs) And if you do invest in something, don't invest more than 2% of your net worth now. I mean, these things you need to pay attention to and especially anyone coming into wealth of any sort. Like you did, Sam. (laughs) I mean, did you wish that you would have read this article when you exited your company and had all these millions all of a sudden? No. Be, the, actually, the funny thing is, is I did read this. I read it about two months before we sold it because someone sent it to me, which was immediately when I started following James Altcher because I'm like, I can't believe this happened. This can actually happen. I got scared. But the the crazy thing is, is James went through, you know, obviously a, a big low point after he had his windfall and I did too, but my situation was completely different, right? My whole life was always predicated on success and what success would bring me. And I was always living off this kind of superficial bucket list that I put together. And on my way up, as I was hitting these milestones and success and able to now do these, these things that were on my bucket list, it was so thrilling. I would get off in a plane in a new place and it was, it was just this remarkable feeling of being able to do these things. And then when I sold the business and I didn't have any responsibility, all I had was time and now I had money, I could do these things by just writing a check or swiping a credit card. And after about six months, it lost. It's, it told, I totally got numb to it. And then, you know, if, if that's what, you figure your life uh, was predicated on was success and what it would bring you. I just, I, I felt like I had nothing to look forward to and it was horrible. Like talk about problems that are hard to relate to. <sighs> Man, I, I'm, I can remember walking down the street in Bangkok and trying to find a gang to just beat it out of me because I didn't know how to get it out of my head. It was, it was a really, really horrible feeling. But then again, his content came to help me because I started looking at these things like you need to stay creative. You need to stay healthy. You need to stay in shape. You need to keep your mind working actively on something. I started doing these things and, you know, I started, started feeling a lot better. I love it. And this is exactly why we share top name guests like James Altucher. Mm-hmm. It's because they've been through what a lot of you guys listening are going to could be going through. And if we can learn from their experience and not make the same mistakes, our lives would be so much better off. And even though I haven't exited for millions of dollars, 
I've actually dreamed about what it would be like mm-hmm. if I won $10 million in the lottery. And I start, at first I was really excited. I started making a list of everything I'd buy. I'm like, buy a Ferrari and a Lamborghini. I'd buy, you know, a Porsche and, you know, these other six cars. But then I'll need a place to put it. So I'll need a house with at least a six car garage. So I wrote that down yeah. and I started thinking, okay, well, how many bedrooms do I want? What am I going to furnish it in? Where am I going to have it? And after maybe just about half an hour, even just daydreaming and being excited, I started getting so overwhelmed and anxious and depressed mm-hmm. thinking, now I have all these responsibilities to fill up this house yeah. just so I can spend this money. And with all of that new stuff is more and more headaches. And I think that's one big reason that people come into success get super stressed. They have more responsibility, more things to take care of. If you buy a boat, you have maintenance, insurance, gas. You have 10 more headaches just associated with owning that boat. If you have a house with a six-car garage, you have six cars, paperwork's piling up. So it's really a matter of how you put money to use. And that's why one thing that I think is really cool of like the, the minimalist lifestyle, I mean, we're in between minimalists. Sometimes we're minimalists. Sometimes we're not fully. But Well, right now we are. We are sure, literally yeah. walking across the entire country of Ireland with nothing but a backpack. And 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 literally I am walking across with basically a Jansport backpack because British Airways lost my stuff. So I don't even have anything. I only have like my computer on my bag and, and one hat I bought. But But what was crazy is as we were walking today, I mean this was you know four hours into a six hour walk I laughed and I kind of joked to Sam said, Do you even want them to find your luggage? Is there anything you even really need or want in there? And you said no. Yeah, it's amazing. It puts it all in perspective once you don't have it and you realize how little that you actually need. And so much of the core of this episode, when I think back to it, tons of great takeaways. But I I really feel like a big piece of it is about bouncing back. And James mentions that, you know, one tenth of 1,000 people or businesses actually get to where they really want to go. And Statistically, 85% of startups fail. Another 10% of those are mediocre. 3% do okay. And maybe 1% make some, you know, make people involved wealth. And I think so much of it is really just learning how to bounce back because the more you do in business, the more you do in life, the more you travel, the more things that you're involved with, the more setbacks you're going to have. It's just, it's a law of life, right? So, I mean, how do you, how do you summarize like, you know, bouncing back and, and, and overcoming. Well, one big takeaway I got from this episode and this interview, he kind of just brushed over. But when he mentioned that he was losing his house, Mm -hmm. in my mind, I was thinking he had $15 million. Why did he still have a mortgage? And I realized that most people in that position, they're not buying their house in, in cash. They are buying everything above and beyond what they actually need. And they're like, oh, well, I can afford this, you know, $20,000 a month payment or whatever it was. You know, you know, why, why would I pay it off? Yeah. I have all this money. It's unlimited. It's not a big deal. So a big takeaway I got from it is to set yourself up, pay off, you know, if you are going to buy something, pay it off, live minimalistically. So that way, if you have that cash, you're not going to, you have, there's no chance of, something happening and just going to zero. Yeah. I, one other thing people get in trouble with, we hear about this with, you know, with celebrities and sports stars all the time is they go out and buy a $10 million house and then they don't realize, okay, even if I paid for that in cash, how much is the maintenance? How much is the insurance? How many people do I have to employ to take care of this and pay the bills? And do I trust those people? So headaches can really mount up if you come into wealth fast and don't know how to manage it. So I think his article has so many great points about just not doing things for a while. Take your time. Don't deploy the money. The more investments to make, the more stress you're probably going to have. Just take your time. There's there's no rush, right? Yeah. And I also really like how he really strives and, and says, yeah, take care of yourself first. So whether you're on top of the world right now or you're in the bottom of the pits of hell, yeah. you have to take care of yourself if you want to do well. You know, and, and he mentions eating well, exercising, sleeping well. And honestly, I, th- I think right now I'm actually at a huge low point in my life. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of people don't realize this because if you just look at my Instagram or you look at my blog, it looks like I'm just traveling the world having fun. Yeah. And a part of that is true. You know, I have money in the bank from selling my last businesses, even though it wasn't for 
you know, fifteen million dollars, mm-hmm. it was enough where I don't have to worry about responsibilities and bills for at least a few years, or if I want to live cheaply, maybe even for the rest of my life. Yeah. But now I have a whole new set of problems trying to figure out what do I want to do in life, what really makes me happy, and throughout these last couple of years of building the businesses and having so much stress. Mm-hmm. You know, going through a bad breakup a few years ago, having my whole life kind of tumble down. I've been, you know, drinking too much, partying too much, eating crappy food. I wasn't, I haven't been exercising. Mm-hmm. And that has led me to one of the lowest, play, you know, points in my life right now. And by listening to his interview and having him have, you know, gone through that before, mm-hmm. it really gives me hope and says, okay, you know, I gotta, I gotta focus on the basics again, get back, to, you know, to being creative because just like with James, that is the thing I'm good at. Yeah. I hate doing all the things that he hates doing, <laughs> yeah, right. but I enjoy being creative. Right. I think that his material, you know, he's, he's, he's a guy that's been through it, right? There's a lot of people out there talking about things, trying to give advice. They haven't done it. People are trying to tell you how to build wealth. They haven't done it. Trying to, people that are trying to tell you how to get out of rough situations. They haven't done it, right? James is super credible. He's been through all this stuff. And when you read through his content, you know, because even though he's covering a broad range of important topics, it is all on point, right? I mean, and any subject I've sent, I've sent his articles to my mom about reinventing herself. I've sent his articles to friends I have that are just getting out of college in Southeast Asia about becoming creative and, and finding drive. I've sent articles to people in Europe, of, you know, how to get out of tough situations. And it's like, it's the, it's the best of the best, right? I really do think he is the best out there in content for, for this type of stuff that we're talking about, right? Definitely one of the kings in content, but super value add in lifestyle content. I definitely love it. And I'm curious, after interviewing James and chatting with him, what are you going to change personally in your life? I'm going to become a choicist, right? Oh. Great word. And the biggest mistake, I mean, I've made a couple mistakes in the last three years since we sold the business. Uh, obviously, a lot of investment mistakes that we talk about on this podcast all the time. New ones seem to be popping up all the time. Hopefully, those will be limited going forward. But what I've allowed to happen is I have allowed way too many things that I don't want to deal with pop up simply because of the amount of investing that I've do, I'm doing, opening foreign bank accounts and foreign companies and investing in in property and startups and things around the world has all of a sudden snowballed to where every single day I'm getting emails about filings and paperwork and audits and all this stuff that nobody wants. I mean, very few people want to do all that stuff, right? I want to focus on the creative part. I want to focus on on networking and finding good opportunities. So. First off, I'm going to, I'm going to cut back on the amount of investing that I'm doing. I already have started doing that. I'm going to take that to a much deeper level and I'm going to work on finding a few people that I trust that can help me do these things. Just like James is doing. He's investing in, in 30, you know, angel startups. That is a lot of paperwork. That is, a, that's a lot of tracking and, and, uh, and collaborating with those people. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to model it exactly like that. And I'm going to become a choices. I'm going to focus each day on doing things that I want to, where I know I can add value and try, try to eliminate the rest. I love it. And what's crazy is Sam and I did not talk about our big takeaways part of this because we wanted to keep it spontaneous. Mm-hmm. But my takeaway or what I'm going to be doing is very similar to what Sam just said, where I realized, I mean, there's a lot of things I just do not like doing. Mm-hmm. Not only am I not good at it, I just dread doing it. Like all the analytics, my, my websites and I like the creative parts. I like writing blog posts. I like writing about things that I care about. Mm-hmm. And that's why, you know, when you go on johnnyft.com, it's like a wide range of topics from travel to business to, uh, just all sorts of random things. Mm-hmm. And now after listening to James, I realize, I don't have to just write about kind of the new cool things that people want to hear about. I can write about the depressing crap that's happening in my (laughs) life and people will still want to reflect and they'll learn from it. But one thing that I've been terrible about is the marketing side of it, monetizing the website. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this, but for the last two months, I've not been able to collect email addresses on my site because... It's just broken. Yeah. And people have actually been emailing me and saying, Hey, can you add uh, my email to your email yeah. list? 
And James brought up a great point where he doesn't like doing that stuff either. So he just hires someone else to do it. Yeah. And it just blew my mind thinking, like, why don't I do that? Because there's so much money I'm leaving on the table and so many more people I can reach. I really liked how he said he doesn't want to write for three people. He wants to write for as many people as possible. Yeah. And if you don't like doing it, unfortunately, a lot of times it gets overlooked, which has been a lot of my mistakes in investing. I haven't done the, the, the DD thoroughly enough. I haven't looked through the underwriting and I've ended up losing a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to be able to share those experiences with our listeners. And, you know, I'm improving at those things. I'm going to find more people to help out with those things. And hopefully we can all continue to learn and, and prosper together. Learn and grow. I love it. So if you guys want to learn more from James, check out his two podcasts. Yeah. One is called Ask James Altucher. And one is the James Altucher Show. It is one of the biggest podcasts in the world. I think over 70 million downloads. A couple of my favorite episodes, Tony Robbins. He's had on Dr. Wayne Dyer and pretty much the the biggest names out there. Uh, I love Dr. Wayne Dyer. So I thought it was super cool to hear him on some great books there. But check out some of his his episodes. Let us know in the Boss Lounge which of of the episodes are your favorite. And uh, let's get some chat going on that. I love it. And if you guys want to talk about this episode or leave a comment or tell us what you learned from it, Join our private Facebook group. Just go to investlikeaboss.com, click on bonus, and there will be a form where you can fill out and we'll send you an invite to our private group. Also, big, big thank you to everyone who's been leaving these amazing five-star reviews on iTunes for the Invest Like a Boss podcast. You guys and gals are the reason why we're able to get big name guests like James Altucher on the show. So please, please, please take five minutes Go into the clunky iTunes app <laughs> <laughs> on your Mac uh, or f- find some way to review it or share the this episode uh, or our site with anybody that you know, anyone that you think would get a lot of value from this. Mm-hmm. This week, I really want to thank Brooke Craven. She said, awesome podcast, five stars. Sam and Johnny, host in the Best Like a Boss, highlight all modern investing in this can't miss podcast. The host... And their expert guests offer insightful advice that is helpful to anyone that listens. Thanks again, Brooke. And thanks to everyone who's taking the time to review the podcast. And thanks again to James. Thanks again to James. And we'll see you guys all next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.